Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video, we're going to talk about the dissolution of ionic compounds. We're going to remind ourselves of what we mean by the structure of water. We're going to take a look at the process of dissolution or dissolving. What happens when a substance is placed into water and starts to dissolve? We're then going to um, introduce this related concept of solubility. This idea, we're going to define it. We're going to then see how it's related to and affected by temperature. So this is the structure of a water molecule. We've seen this before. You've understood this before. A couple of aspects I want to, want to remind you of. Water is a polar molecule. We have positive ends of the hydrogens and a negative end of the oxygen. So we can draw a dotted line across to um, represent kind of the, the difference between one end of the molecule and the other. Um, it has a bent structure, this, this 3D shape, that it's not in a straight line. It is at this kind of an angle with 104.5 degrees between these two bonds. Um, and and this, this aspect of the structure of water is going to be quite critical when we think about what happens next. So it's got positive and negative ends due to its bent structure. So here we have a crystal of sodium chloride. Okay, so we're going to look at through this four different stages of dissolving that we're going to discuss. You can see that it's got a a 3D lattice or a 3D structure of positive and negative ions, um, so it extending in three directions, in th these three dimensions. Okay, so each ion is surrounded by other ions of the opposite charge, and they're locked together with strong ionic bonds. Okay, that, they, that is, that holding this crystal together are very strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the positive and negative ions. So we take this crystal and we put it in water. What happens is that we have these ions around the edges that are now interacting with the water molecules that are around them. And what we get is this formation of ion dipole forces, that the, the negative end of the water molecule attracts to the positive um, ions, um, and the positive end of water molecules attract to the negative ions. But that is that these water molecules are attracting and then removing the ions that are very much on the edge of these, the crystal. Now, it, it makes sense that it's on the edges or on, the, on these, these exposed faces because you can't attract or, or, or be interacting with an ion that's buried deep within the crystal. It has to be on the ones that can be touched um, on the outside. Okay, so the, the delta positive end of the water molecule will be attracting and starting to remove those chloride ions. That's what we're seeing up here. And the delta minus negative end will be attracting the positive sodium ions. Okay, so we can see here. So you can see that the white... Hydrogen um, parts are what's interacting over here, and the red oxygen parts are what's interacting over here. Okay, so we've got over here this idea that water molecules are removing ions from around the edges. More and more are kind of being pulled out, being pulled away from this tight group. That means that then we expose more and more ions. Okay, so that the crystal itself starts to, to decrease in size. More and more of these ions are being removed um, by water molecules, and so the crystal will become noticeably smaller. Now, we may not necessarily easily see that at our level because we're talking such small crystals, you know, our eye can't pick up this detail, but we're starting from something big and it's getting smaller and smaller until gradually we get to the stage where all the ions have been completely separated. There is no crystal anymore, that each ion has been surrounded by or encapsulated by H2O molecules. Now, you can't really see it very effectively in this diagram because it's representing 2D, but there would also be water molecules either coming out of the screen and then extending in, into the screen in the third dimension. That is, the water molecules surround these ions on all sides. Um, typically six of them, that is, if you imagine like the faces of a cube, you've kind of got the north, south, east and west, then you've got one on top and one underneath. They're all kind of attracting and holding these ions in place so they don't stick to one another. Okay, so we've gone through those four stages. We start from a complete crystal where removing ions from around the edges gets gradually smaller and smaller until all the ions are removed and surrounded. So that's what we mean by dissolving. Let's define this word, this, this noun called solubility. So solubility tell is a measure of the maximum quantity that of a substance that will dissolve in a given quantity of a solvent, typically water we're talking about here. Okay, so you know how many grams or how many moles will dissolve per given amount. Okay, so to make it standard, we tend to report things in moles per litre or grams per litre. Sometimes solubility can be expressed in grams per 100 mils in a bit more of an everyday context, but in chemistry, this is, tends to be how we define it. When we express solubility in moles per litre, we call it the molar solubility. How many moles of that substance will dissolve in water for every litre of water that we have? 
you know, in the same way that now, um, you know, that, that then um, we've, we've talked about concentration in the past, just defining what a solution is, you know, it means that then we can start to do calculations or, or processes to work out how much stuff is actually in that water. But once we get the solution to reach this solubility limit, this, you know, we've dissolved as much as possible, we say the solution is saturated, um, there is no extra space, no extra room, no more solid will dissolve, it will sit undissolved at the bottom. Okay, so this solubility is, you know, defines that point at which we go from being from not saturated or unsaturated to being saturated. Okay, and so we tend to put compounds or substances into three categories depending on how much dissolves in a litre of water. Where it's easiest to define this in terms of moles because mass for different compounds will vary. You know, silver ions weigh a lot more than sodium ions, you know, which weigh more than lithium ions, for example. So defining in mass terms becomes very um, relative, like, or, or, you know, it's harder to compare, whereas moles per litre is very consistent. So something that dissolves more, you can make solutions of more than 0.1 moles in a litre are soluble. If we've got compounds that can dissolve less than 0.01 moles in a litre, we call them insoluble. Between these two fairly arbitrary values, we call it slightly or sparingly soluble, okay, or partially soluble. So some of it will dissolve, but not as much as a fully soluble compound, but more than an insoluble one. Okay, so we kind of put things into these categories. So now let's have a look at this idea of how solubility relates to temperature. Okay, because it's very important for us to be able to look at this relationship. So solubility for most compounds varies with temperature. Um, some varies only a very small amount, others vary significantly. You can see that of these two compounds, the potassium nitrate, KNO3, varies in solubility much more than potassium chloride, or KCl. If you look up solubility curves, you can see a whole range of different um, variations in solubility with different compounds. Sometimes they're a straight line, sometimes they're a curve. Sometimes they increase, sometimes they decrease. But for solids, that it tends to increase with an increasing temperature. Um, this is regardless of whether the dissolving process is exothermic or endothermic, because the idea is that, that generally the entropy of the solution increases as we dissolve more stuff into it. Okay, so which means that it, it becomes a spontaneous process. Um, the reason that as the temperature goes up, this gets stronger is that um, you get more vibrations within the particles in the solid. It means those bonds become a bit weaker and therefore they're more susceptible to being removed by the water molecules. Okay, so weaker bonds in the crystal means that the attraction to the water becomes a lot more um, relevant, you know, a lot stronger by comparison. Now if we have a look at gases, I mean, I know we're talking about ionic compounds at the moment, so this is, this is not directly um, part of that, but gases show the opposite relationship. That is, gas, the solubility of gases tends to decrease as temperature increases. Okay, so if you have a bottle of Coke in the fridge, then more of that gas will be dissolved than if you have that bottle on the bench on a hot day where it's warm. Um, it will go flat a lot faster, um, or, you know, there, it, will, it won't have that, that gas escaping kind of sound to the same amount because gases tend to become less soluble as the temperature increases. The reason for that is that we are giving the gas particles greater kinetic energy, which means they tend to have a greater tendency to escape the solution, which means that there's less actually dissolved in it. Okay, because gases have that ability to be able to escape a solution in a way that solid particles or, or things can't. You know, they can um, form precipitates and drop to the bottom, but they can't escape the container like a gas will. Okay, so we reminded ourselves about the bent structure of water that makes it a polar molecule. The fact that we've got positive and negative ends is what is causing this process of dissolution where the ions become removed from the crystal, surrounded by water molecules, so they're separate. Um, that then we define solubility as this maximum amount of stuff that we can dissolve in a given amount of water, for example, and expressed in moles per litre or grams per litre. And we looked at the effect of temperature on the solubility of both solids and gases. All right, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.